Hello again. Welcome to episode two of the Peregrine Prude. I'm your rambling host, Colby Matthews. I did not give my name in the first episode, so there it is. Um, in today's episode, oh, first of all, I'd like to thank whoever my second subscriber is. Um, I don't know who you are. Maybe it's my mom. If so, thanks mom. But I don't think my mom has a YouTube uh, subscription. So I, I don't think it can be her. Um, I know the first subscriber was my son. So whoever number two is, thank you. Alrighty, even though, <laughs> even though in my, uh, in the cha in the description of my channel, I discourage subscription comments, likes. That's a little bit facetious. Um, I'm really quite apathetic about all of this. I'm doing this just for pure hobby and fun. If it, this channel grows into a huge success, that would be great. But of course, I did not ex expect anything like that to happen. So. Thanks for the subscription, but I will not. I will not ask for subscribers. Um, but if you want to subscribe, more power to you. Today we're going to be looking at a wonderful uh, book, social commentary by the theologian D. A. Carson. The title of the book is "The Intolerance of Tolerance." So according to Wikipedia, because, you know, D.A. Carson, I said that so sarcastically, he's actually a great, brilliant man. D.A. Carson is a reformed biblical scholar. He is a distinguished emeritus professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and president and co-founder of the Gospel Coalition. He has written or edited about 60 books and currently serves as president of the Evangelical Theological Society. So he's quite prolific, uh, in a, at least in a literary sense, I'm sure in other senses as well. So the intolerance of tolerance, let's dig into it a bit. Um, on the inside of the book jacket, I'm going to read you the uh, summary a little bit here. Tolerance currently occupies a very high place in Western societies. It is considered gauche, even boorish, to question it. The intolerance of tolerance, however, questioning tolerance, or at least contemporary understandings of tolerance, is exactly what D.A. Carson does. Carson traces the subtle but enormous shift in the way we have come to understand tolerance over recent years. From defending the rights of those who hold different beliefs to affirming all beliefs as equally valid and correct. He looks back at the history of this shift and discusses its implications for culture today, especially its bearing on democracy, discussions about good and evil, and Christian truth claims. Using real-life examples that will sometimes arouse laughter and sometimes make the blood boil, Carson argues not only that the new tolerance is socially dangerous and intellectually debilitating, but also that it actually leads to genuine intolerance of all who struggle to hold fast to their beliefs. Pretty interesting. In the introduction, he uh, starts out. You kind of got a, a sniff of what that was, of what he's talking about with the old tolerance and the new tolerance, and how that it was a subtle shift, but it actually has it actually has enormous implications. And here he says that uh, the the old tolerance is which I believe is what actual tolerance is, is accepting exi the existence of different views, right? I, you have Muslims, 
they do not hold to the values, they do not hold to the views about God, the one true God as revealed in the Bible. They do not hold that, as I do. So, of course, differing views exist, right? We, and we, we tolerate their existence. But the new tolerance, I'm not going to do air quotes every time, new tolerance, um, is the acceptance of different views. There's a subtle shift there. You're not accepting, you know, the, the word existence, except the existence of different views is the old way. The new way is acceptance of different views. You're not merely accepting that they exist. You have to accept, the claim is, you have to accept that they're equally valid as truth claims. Carson says, we leap from permitting the articulation of beliefs and claims with which we do not agree to asserting that all beliefs and claims are equally valid. Thus we slide from the old tolerance to the new. And what a downhill slide that is. Um, just this morning, by the way, I'm feeling quite fresh now. I had my Sunday afternoon nap which is always great. I didn't actually sleep that I can remember, but I had about a good solid two hours where I was just laying in bed with my eyes closed. So that was pretty nice, <laughs> nevertheless. But in, this, in uh, this morning's Sunday sermon, we had a guest uh, preacher there this morning, and um, he preached from uh, Judges chapter 2. And if you would just bear with me, because I want to read these ver these 23 verses in Judges chapter 2, kind of as a, a comparison to what we're going to look at here in D.A. Carson's The Intolerance of Tolerance. Judges 2, verses 1 through 23. Now the angel of the Lord went up, went up from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said, I brought you up from... Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words, to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept, and they called the name of that place Bochum, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord died at the age of 110 years, and they buried him with, within the boundaries of his inheritance in Timnath Eris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods, from among the gods of other of the from among the gods of the peoples who were around them, and bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies, so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, and the Lord had sworn to them, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. And in comes the judges. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they 
whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the ways in which their fathers had walked and, ha and had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died, in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hands of Joshua. So I want to be careful. I'm not making a uh, a hard fast comparison between the Old Testament nation of Israel and the United States, right? I don't want I want to make it clear I'm not doing that. That would not be an accurate thing to do. However, America is a very pluralistic society, right? In one way or the other, we have a very Judeo-Christian foundation in our in our in our society and the underpinnings of our government they had a solid understanding of the the uh, fallenness of human nature thus the need for checks and balances right thus the need that's why they didn't want to serve under a monarchy anymore because monarchy like one man in control and his appointees they are subject to the whims of of the sinful nature of the, that 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 power elite so they wanted the checks and balances that we see in the, the different, the federalism, the different levels of government. All of that is a check against the fallen nature of humanity, the sinfulness of humanity. It's not a perfect check, but it is, it is a check nevertheless. Um, so we are very, we're very pluralistic, um, diverse nation here in the USA. And I would say that we have, you know, we still have a lot of Christians, a lot of great believers, but our our cult the cultural hegemony of Christianity is definitely on the wane. It's definitely on the decline and it has been for years. And as much as we sometimes mourn that we we shouldn't mourn it because, oh, we're losing control, we're losing power in that regard. And that should never, that should never have been our, our motive in the first place. But we should mourn Christian cultural, I, I pronounced that wrong, hegemony. <laughs> Earlier I pronounced it wrong. We should uh, mourn Christian cultural hegemony because... of the potential loss of um, souls that will be won because the word is not getting out there to enough people. It's not having the impact that it would if uh, we were... But at the same time, it may reach different people um, than it would if it were still kind of the, the uh, cultural you know, the cultural powerhouse that maybe it, it kind of used to be. Nevertheless, God is all in control of it. God is in control of the rise of Christian culture, and He is in control of the decline in Christian culture. It's all according to His will. Does that mean that as Christians we should just stand idly by and not not try to um, witness for Christ? That we should just stand idly by with our arms crossed and watch the decline go? No, we should still do what we've always been called to do, and that is preach the gospel to to the lost, right? We have, there is a virus <laughs> since the fall that is called sin. And 
those who believe we have the one true 100% effective inoculation against that virus. Yes, we still manifest that right that virus, but we don't it's not going to kill us, spiritually kill us. And we want other people to receive that virus or I'm sorry, they've already got the virus. We want other people to receive that vaccination, that inoculation which is Jesus Christ the Lord, salvation through his death, burial, and resurrection, and be to be indwelled with the Holy Spirit to guide our lives for ultimate, the ultimate hope and promise of eternal life with God in heaven. And so you see here that even whenever Israel came into the promised land, that they disobeyed God by eradicating, by not eradicating from the land all of the, uh, the, the peoples that God told them to eradicate. And then eventually, God says, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna push them out. I'm not gonna let you have victory over these people. And why we see it down here? It was um, in order to, in order to test Israel by them. I think one of the benefits of Christi Christianity and Christian culture and belief being in decline in the USA is that it helps to separate the wheat from the tares. It helps separate the Christians who were claiming Christianity just simply because of uh it was popular or it was socially acceptable or like they they needed to do it to get ahead socially in their work or in their society in their community it separates those who were do who were a part of the christian culture for ulterior ulterior motives from the true believers and i think that is one, that is, that is a valuable um silver lining one of them of Christianity in cultural decline, and I think that's also how God was using these um, these uh, idolatrous people groups around the Israelites in the time of the judges. He was using them to test them, to see who was true, who really believed, and who did not really believe. Of course, God knows that already. He doesn't need to test people to know that. He already knows that. But that's how he operates with humanity here. I just heard that this morning, and that clicked with what I want to present to you further in this book. Carson goes on to write, Does this mean that Christians will wish all positions contrary to their own were extirpated? or that Christians insist that Jesus is the only way to God? The former is patently untrue, that we wish all positions contrary to our own were extirpated. But the latter is certainly true, that the claim that Jesus is the only way to God. At least if Christians are trying to be faithful to the Bible. Christians do think that Jesus is the only way to God, but does that make them intolerant? In the former sense of intolerant, not at all. The fact remains, however, that the fact remains, however, that any sort of exclusive truth claim is widely viewed as a sign of gross intolerance. But the latter depends absolutely on the second meaning of tolerance. Right? Now, he goes on here and he says the first the first question he asks he he asks, does this mean that Christians wish all positions contrary to their own were extirpated? And he says, no. But is that is that real? I mean, is that real? I mean, do I wish that the Muslim religion would be extirpated? Not Muslims, mind you, but that the idea that, that mu the Muslim religion itself would be extirpated, would be extinguished from this earth, and that all Muslims will become Christians? Do I wish that? Yeah, I, I do. I do wish that. 
do I wish that all uh, all pe you know all all people who aren't Christian are, would become Christians? Yes. But so that that one's I don't know that my answer to that would be such a clear no. There can be a lot of diversity within Christianity. In fact, I believe it was C.S. Lewis who said that there's actually more diversity. There should be more diversity within Christianity than there is outside of Christianity. Because inside of Christianity, we can serve God in so kinds of so many different kinds of ways. Um, God has there's such variety within Christendom, so many different ways to serve God. But outside of Christendom, there's just rebellion. There's just sin. Of course, these sin, the sin and the rebellion takes on different aspects as well. But there's more true variety. Um, within the kingdom of God. At least there should be. Maybe it doesn't really play out like that sometimes because we get, we uh, unfortunately, Christians, we fall into the, the idea that we want to be like our, you know, we want to be holy like our neighbor. We don't want to be holy necessarily like God wants me to be holy, right? I mean, the, holiness looks different according to different people. There is the standard of the Bible that you do not want to break out of. But within that standard, there's, a plethora of different angles um, and azimuths that you can shoot on, on your way to serving God. And here uh, Carson is talking about how um, God is actually the author of tolerance. He allows sin to fester on this earth, both uh, regarding his people in the Old Testament Israel, and also with his people nowadays, the church. Um, I'm a Christian, but I sin. I sin. I fight tooth and nail against it, but I still sin. And I repent when I do. But still, I, I sin, both uh, consciously and unconsciously. And he, he has tolerance towards that, and he also has tolerance for the unregenerate. He allows them to enjoy the benefits of creation. You know, the sun shines on the believers and unbelievers alike. That's not verbatim, verbatim but that's the general idea there. Yet... Is not God's patience and forbearance in delaying Christ's return a form of, to of tolerance intended to lead people to repentance? It's from Romans 2.4. Hence the distinction. Bad ideas and bad actions are tolerated in the first sense of toleration, reluctantly and with bold articulation of what makes them bad. While the people who hold those bad ideas or perform those bad actions are tolerated again in the first sense, without any sense of begrudging reluctance, but in the hope that they will come to repentance and faith. Tolerance toward persons, in this sense, is surely a great virtue to be nurtured and cultivated. Right? This is the whole idea of you love the sinner, you hate the sin. Right? You love the person. You love the soul. Because you recognize that person as being created in the image of God. And and that, that their soul will exist in eternity somewhere. And you hope that that will be heaven with you and with God. And so we love that person, that eternal being that every person is. But we hate the sin that if they don't believe in Jesus Christ, will lead them to eternal hell. Over here now. Still in, still in the introduction. <laughs> this is long form, ain't it? Alrighty. One version of this older view of tolerance, one might, one might call it the secular libertarian version, has another wrinkle to it. In his famous text on liberty, John Stuart Mill lived 1806 to 1873, 
opts for a secularist basis to tolerance. In the domain of religion, Mills argues, there are insufficient rational grounds for verifying the truth claim of any religion. The only reasonable stance toward religion is therefore public agnosticism and private benign tolerance. For Mill, people should always be tolerant in the domain of religion, not because this is the best way to uncover the truth, but precisely because whatever the truth, there are insufficient means for uncovering it. And so this is kind of the uh, origins of postmodernism. The idea that you can't empirically prove any uh, fundamental, the basis of any truth claim. And, and in a sense, that is true. You can't empirically prove it. Um, I think it was Lewis or G.K. Chesterton who spoke about C.S. Lewis or G.K. Chesterton who talked about that you know, Christianity is really kind of, in a sense, in the strict definition, it's kind of like agnosticism. You know, agnosticism means not knowing. And in a sense, that's truth because what is faith? Faith is believing in that which is unseen, right? Now, once you believe, you can see it, it, it kind of, it doesn't become, it's not agnosticism anymore. Once you believe, your eyes are open, the scales are removed, and everything reveals God to you. You can uh, interpret everything through that, through that matrix of knowing that God is, exists, and He loves you, and He's personal, and He has a plan for your life, and for, and for all of existence. But there is that aspect that it, it kind of has that agnostic aspect in the sense that you can't like no no you know there there were the uh, the the Gnostics in the early church that it was eventually pronounced as heretical because they thought there were these secret these secret it was like a secret society basically where there were these secret these divine secrets that you had to know these levels it's, it kind of reminds me of um, the Scientology right. These uh, secrets that that you could work your up, you work your way up to a knowledge of God, um, by these different revelations, and that's not you know that's not true. So it's it's agnostic in a sense that you can't empirically prove prove that God exists or that the God of the Bible is true. You can only know it once you believe it by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit indwelling you and giving you that that seal. Now that being said, I greatly support Christian apologetics, the work of Christian apologists. Most of them are brilliant, amazing. They do God's work in a very special way. But can Christian apologetics in and of themselves ever save anybody? No. No, they cannot. Christian apologetics can never save anybody outside, you know, divorced from the gospel presentation. So they have to go hand in hand. And 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 even more than that, from God's activation of faith within a person. So apologetics, they're, they're, they're a tool in the toolbox of evangelism and gospel presentation. They cannot save any. They can never ultimately convince somebody. You can't change your mind um, just based upon facts and intellectual presentations and information. That, that doesn't save you. It's a heart change. It's a heart change. It, you have to surrender your mind, <laughs> in a sense. You have to surrender what you know, you think you know, and believe. Step out in faith. And once you do, then things just start, they start clicking. All the, gauge, all the gears start engaging. 
and your the scales are peeled back and you see and you are no longer a living zombie you are living for god you are you are beginning your true true life okay this is a good one oh my goodness we are still in the introduction oh, I'm a, this might be a two part two part series I like this because this is basically uh, what postmodernism is in a nutshell. With that John Stuart Mill uh, passage earlier, we kind of saw the formation of postmodernism, but this one is kind of postmodernism in a nutshell. The new approach to tolerance argues that all rings are equally magic. That means the reason for being tolerant is not that, that is not that we cannot know which ring is magic nor that this is the best way to find out which ring is magic, but rather that since all the rings are equally magic or non-magic, it is irresponsible to suggest that any of the rings is merely a clever imitation without magical power. We must be tolerant not because we cannot distinguish the right path from the wrong path, but because all paths are equally right. Yes, this is postmodernism that... We can't know anything, ultimately, um, know what, whether anything is ultimately right or wrong. That all, all morality is relativistic. And this is why the new, this, this is from where the new tolerance arose. And it continues to arise in our day and with very, unfortunately, potent force with uh, the woke but not awake um, culture. Here um, Carson quotes, uh, he quotes Bernard Goldberg in, in Goldberg's book, A Hundred People Who Are Screwing Up America. <laughs> Here's the problem, as far as I'm concerned. Over the years, as we became less close-minded and more tolerant of all the right things like civil rights, somehow we became indiscriminately tolerant. You're so judgmental, became a major league put down in anything goes America, as if being judgmental of crap in the culture is a bad thing. <laughs> I like the way that guy writes. A hundred people who are screwing up America. I might have to read that one at one point. Yeah, you know, people say, people, whenever you're engaged with somebody in a conversation and you mention that oh, something is sinful, <laughs> they they love to say, ah, oh, you, you, you know, judge, judge not lest ye be judged. Okay, that's the first part. Yeah, you got the first part down. What's the rest of the part, right? Judge not lest ye be judged, for in the way that you judge, you so you also shall be judged, right? It's not saying we're not supposed to judge judge people. What it's saying is that it's saying be careful how you judge people. Be discriminate in your discrimination. Be discriminate in your judgments. Make sure that you're not being a hypocrite, basically. So whenever we judge the behavior of somebody else, we got to make sure we're not using our own arbitrary, subjective, you know, Colby Matthews standard. I have to be using the standard of the Word of God, and I have to make sure I know the Word of God well enough to apply it to that situation. And I also have to make sure I know that person, you know, I mean, unless it's just a clear thing that it's, you know, unless it's a clear, clear sin, then, I mean, you know, sometimes I got to know, like I talked about in the first episode, you have to know that the ins and outs of that person's situation. You got to, there's so much you have to know before you can condemn somebody. We looked at that um, in the meditations of Marcus, of Marcus Aurelius. So we have to make sure that the standard we're using is God's word and not our own arbitrary standard outside of God's word and we also have to make sure that when we judge that we are willing and that we do 
apply that same judgment to ourselves. We are not outside of that judgment. And that's what that, that verse means. Judge not lest you be judged, for howsoever you judge another, you too shall be judged. It's not judge not lest you be judged. We're all going to be judged. We all are judged. It's a warning of how to judge people and how to apply it equally to everybody and to yourself and to get it from the right source, which is the Word of God. Um, and since Christians are, we make an exclusive claim uh, for salvation, right? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. I mean, you can't get any more exclusive than that, and that is, that's from the very words of Jesus himself. Since we are exclusive, and since we do hold to a high moral standard, because God holds to the highest, holiest moral standard, that does make us targets. In this pluralistic, anything goes, all truth claims are legitimately and equally potentially valid. That does make us a target. Um, I'll, I never will remember, uh, forget, I don't know, no, <laughs> I never will forget, um, I live in southern, rural southern Indiana, and um, I was in this college town, uh, liberal college town this was probably in my late teens or early 20s and i went into one of these uh you know kind of new age shops um i like you know some of that aesthetics uh the new age aesthetic kind of appeals to me even though i i don't like all i don't like the uh philosophical underpinnings of it so i was wandering around in there smelling the incense and they had this uh this spinning rack um, with some bumper stickers that, and one of those bumper stickers it depicted um, a stick man and a woman with a Bible in their hands like you know, a little book with a cross on it indicating a Bible and around it was a, around those two was a circle with a line through it so basically it was a bumper sticker that was saying no Christians that's what it was saying and even in my relative youth, I thought, oh man, I'm in a new age shop. I'm in a liber one of the most liberal um, you know, public universities probably in, in the country. One of them, probably not the, but one of them. And yet look at this clear, clear example of intolerance towards specifically Christians. I mean, it was saying no, I mean, it, was, it wasn't saying it in words, but it was saying it with clear symbolism, no Christians. Like, wow. Wow, and I don't think I spent too much longer, too much time um, in, that, in that shop. And that's, that experience is just what has extrapolated throughout the past two decades in our country with regard to becoming open-minded, but intolerance towards Christians because we are perceived as intolerant but if you're really tolerant you would tolerate even the intolerant <laughs> it's just we are we are people are becoming so open-minded that their brains are falling out splat on the concrete that's what's happening you know that that movie from the 90s uh, mars attacks where you had the aliens and their heads with their brains were in that that kind of glass um, uh, case, and they're like, ah, and they're shooting everybody with lasers and everything, plasma guns, whatever. That is what the modern liberal leftist, maybe not the modern liberal, but that's what the modern leftist is. One who is more on, of, on the Marxist left and the woke culture left. They their minds are so open that their brains 
are falling or have just completely fallen out and they're pure emotions um, I think the crux of this is that this is my comment here that I wrote in the margins people thinking themselves wise new tolerance stems from cowardice and indecision resembling humility but truly a proud a self-proud belief in its own right um, and I, this is further my my um, comment not Carson's uh, it's a deterioration of objectivity and thus a deterioration of humility that stems from it we're like people walking about with our this is another um, iteration of what I just said we're like people walking a, about with our nerve endings poking out of our skin 10 feet we should be sensitive but not hypersensitive right brains no brains all emotions we're not properly sensitive we're improperly hypersensitive Carson goes on to write hey we're out of the introduction he didn't write that but Carson goes on to write the issue ought to be whether any particular act of discrimination is good sensible and proper for there are both good and evil forms of discrimination isn't that obvious I mean, discrimination has this negative connotation but it's not it's not negative it's as neutral of a, a term as you can get right I I discriminated against all other women when I married my wife right that, that's pretty good discrimination um, uh, whenever I purchased my car maybe it wasn't the ideal car I wanted I, I'd actually would love to have a pickup truck but yeah gas fuel efficiency and overall cost can't do it in today's economy at least I can't um, anyways I'm thankful for what I got so essentially what I was saying is that I discriminated against all other vehicles even though I didn't want to I discriminate against all other vehicles when I purchase the vehicle I got right when I go to the store and I buy uh, Kraft macaroni and cheese I did I discriminate against other macaroni and cheese options this is discrimination and it's good and it's proper now if there were uh, a white if I were on a hiring committee and there were a white person and a black person and I choose to hire one over the other and if their uh, skin color or the way their uh, their ethnicity manifests itself in any way came into the rubric of my decision making in that hiring that would be bad discrimination that is bad discrimination Moving along. All right. Hmm. This is a good one. <laughs> this is this was right. Oh, when did he write this? Because this is very prescient. He was very prescient. He wrote this in 2012. And man, 10 years later, 2022. What? We are. I mean, this was already happening back in 2012. Don't get me wrong. But my, it's, the pot is boiling over right now with this. In the name of not offending anyone, we are in danger of appealing to the virtue of tolerance to become more intolerant. And Jordan Peterson has a famous quote um, about, about this. It's that in order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive, right? Being a Christian does not mean we're going to be nice all the time we should be loving yeah loving but being kind being nice is not is not always the same as being loving showing love true charity right telling somebody that they are a sinner and that they have no possibility of a chance that they in in their present state they have no chance at a relationship with God 
the one true holy God, and that they are going to hell in their present condition, that's not very nice, but it's the truth. Now the good thing is that we have the gospel, and that there's a way out of that if they would believe. But many of them, the gospel is but the aroma of death, right? I think it's uh, Paul that writes, you know, to some the, the gospel is just the aroma to the perishing. The gospel is merely an aroma of death. And it doesn't seem very nice to them when we give them the gospel. Because they are perishing. And they're not going to believe. And so the, pre the tr presentation of the truth is just the aroma of their impending physical and unfortunately spiritual death. That's not nice. But it's love, nevertheless, to tell them that. It's a tough love, which is the truest kind of love in my book. Here we go. Okay. Oh, here's G.K. Chesterton, my favorite author of all time, bar none. Okay. Chesterton once said, like, he actually says, okay. Or no, it says G.K. <laughs> I say, okay. You say G.K. Okay. Okay, G.K. Chesterton once said that the purpose of an open mind is the same as that of an open mouth, to close it again on something solid. If that, that, that was Chesterton's quote ending, here it bore back to Carson. If open, if open mindedness is being defined as a refusal to make judgments about religious truth and sexual ethics, for instance, then we are prone to contracting a form of intellectual lockjaw. Yep. So you've got all these uh, analogies for what's going on. Intellectual lockjaw. You can't. Mm, 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 mm. You can't make any pronouncement. You can't make any judgment. You can't speak. You can't think, because you're afraid you'll offend somebody. Like Jordan Jordan Peterson said, your nerve endings are extended ten feet in every direction out of your skin. You're hypersensitive to the to the the feelings and the opinions of others. And you don't want to offend anybody. Your brain has fallen out because you're you were too open-minded. The danger is that oh, he's quoting somebody here. This is not Carson. Here, Carson is quoting Nathan Hatch. Um, Nathan Hatch. Okay. The danger is that the gentle lamb of toleration often returns as the wolf of rel relativism. Christians, then, are both better off and worse off, better in that they are tolerated, maybe, like everyone else, worse in that no claim to truth carries weight any longer. Now, in an eye... Now, yeah, except that I would disagree that Christians are uh, tolerated like everyone else. We have become quite a special target. I, mean, I, I would argue that Islam is a more restrictive uh, belief system uh, than Christianity with regards to uh, political liberality with with liberalism and open-mindedness and yet muslims are much more tolerated than uh than your your average christian it's not surprising we, none of this should surprise us i mean if there's a great uh if if in the next you know 10 or 20 years a great christian uh pogrom happens in the United States where Christians are just killed indiscriminately and tortured and in, enslaved. I mean, you can't imagine that happening, but if it were to happen, we should not be surprised. We should embrace the suffering. We should already be mentally, emotionally, and especially spiritually fortifying ourselves for that possibility to suffer for Christ.
one thing um, that really annoys me <laughs> about a lot of uh, Christians, or at least people who who identify as Christians um, in the liberal liberal churches, I would let's let's call them that. Um, is that they say something like. I don't want to be known for what I'm against. I want to be known for what I'm, what I stand for, right? <laughs> what a crock! <laughs> what a crock! I mean, yeah, you stand for God. You stand for Christ. God, it, God, um, is love. Love is not God, but God is love. But God is also holy wrath. God is also um, judgment. <laughs> He's graceful. He, he is grace. He is mercy. He is love, but He's also wrath and judgment. And He is to be feared. And so, given all these aspects all these attributes of God, and so many more to boot. But given these that I've just mentioned, you can't you can't be known for what you stand for. If we stand for God, we also we also have to stand for what God is against, and that's sin. So if we stand for God, we have to stand for what He is against, and so. The whole idea, it's just, it's just, uh, it's moral peacocking is what it is. It's just trying to get people, um, to like you. Not, not to know the truth or to enjoy God and his word and a, a real relationship with him. It's just trying to skirt the unpleasant parts to get people to like you. And that's not, that's not love. That's self-love only and actually it's it's improper self-love <laughs> at that they think of themselves as wonderfully diverse and broadly representative of the nation because they make sure they hire a re representative mix of gender and race what is lacking however is a representative mix of intellectual and cultural positions there is little diversity of thought Man, I've heard this one before, right? Especially in the uh, in the liberal universities. I work at a, at one such university, and I I must say I I do uh, I I I don't think or feel that I can be honest about my thoughts. I'm I'm staff, I'm not faculty, um, so I'm not um, teaching anybody. I don't have a you know tenure or anything like that. I'm just merely a an an underling staff person at a big um, liberal university, but I'm trying to be as much light as I can be. I try to look for those little moments where I can pick, you know, prick a pinhole in the, in the darkness to let a little light shine in. Um, now I, I love, I love the people I work with. They're incredibly nice. They're very nice. It's a great place to work. I mean, the benefits are great. The, the office, all the people in the office, they're so nice. Um, but if they truly knew where I stood on many issues, they would think that I am incredibly closed-minded and bigoted, and and uh, they would call me a homophobe and a transphobe. They would. I'm not. I was going to get into this later, but I'll get into it right now a little bit. Um, you know, I, I am not a homophobe. I am not a transphobe. Do I believe homosexuality is a sin? Yes, because the Bible, God, as revealed through his word, has said as much. 
more than once. Do I believe that changing your yourself from a man to a woman or vice versa is a sin? Yes, I do. I believe that God made each person either a man or a woman. Gender expressions, is, there's a little fluidity, I think, of, of you know, there, there are some men who are a little bit more feminine. There are some women who are a little bit more masculine. You have some range there, of course. But overall, transgenderism, I believe that's a sin. Does that make me a transphobe and a homophobe? No. Because what is a phobia? A phobia is a, an irrational fear of something. Now, if you're coming from this new tolerance perspective where every belief, every view, every opinion is, is um, equally valid, well then yes, you would think it's a phobia. Because who am I to say that that's a sin? That that should not be? That those behaviors should not be? And that I'm trying to love those people who are engaged in those behaviors or support support or celebrate those behaviors um, when I tell them it's wrong. I'm trying to love them, but they, are, they don't receive it as love, of course. They receive it as hate. They receive it as homophobia because, because they think it's irrational. But no, it is rational. And even they should be able to see that it's rational based on where I'm coming from, right? Ration, the way rationality works is that every... Every rational um, chain, it starts from an unprovable, an unempirically unprovable um, presupposition. So my unprovable, empirically unprovable presupposition is the Word of God. And that's where I start. And that's where my rationality begins. And so... My rationality starts there, and so it is rational that I believe that homosexuality and um, transgenderism are sins. It is rational. It's not ra rational within their system and where their presupposition, presuppositions begin, but they should be able to at least recognize that it's rational within my chain of reason, my chain of logic from where I come from, the Word of God. So I am not homophobic. I am homoprudent. Right? Prudent means using sound judgment. Right? And that's where the word prude, that's one of the reasons why I, I named, why the word prude, even though it has a derogatory connotation these days, that's why I use it in the, the, the title of my channel, the Peregrine Prude. Because I like kind of the idea that you know, the etymology of prude, it comes from prudent. You had these people back in the, you know, back in the during the sexual revolution um, of the '60s, and um, and they were these people were grounded in the m biblical moral ethic, and they did not they were shocked by all the sexual revolution that was going on around them, and the word prudent, which means using sound judgment, was twisted the way that the way that revolutions do they twist words good words into a der derogatory term so the word prudent using sound judgment was twisted into the the shortened form prude to describe a person who is morally outraged and shocked by these outrageous justifiably outrageous behaviors and ways of living and so i wanted to reclaim that word of prude, uh, coming from the word prudent. I wanted to reclaim it, and I wanted to own it, because that is one of my um, goals here, is to be prudent, according to the word of God, when it comes to, to commenting and reviewing um, these works, these literary works. I would like to promote this cha this um, channel the Peregrine Prude on my Facebook. I have over a thousand friends on Facebook that I would like to promote it, but some of those friends are um, co-workers at the university, and I, I just, 
I don't know. I, I can't. To be, I'm just bearing my soul here. I can't risk promoting it right now on Facebook for them to see it because if they were to watch what I'm saying here, they would not appreciate it, and that that would affect that would affect my chances at promotion. And is that a good reason? Maybe not. You know, maybe that's me being a little bit of a coward. And if so, then I'm confessing that right now. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to use wisdom as I navigate this course. So I think that at this moment, I, I can't really promote it on my Facebook page for that reason. I, I hope that's using wisdom and not being a coward. I hope. What is unhealthy in derisive criticism? Uh, hang on, let me get the right tone here. What is... He's not asking a question, so... Okay, what is unhealthy in derisive criticism that does not engage with the views of a particular party, but merely dismisses them and tries to expel them from the discourse on the ground that they are intolerant? This is cancel culture, in a nutshell. Right? Now, cancel culture in some form or another, it's always existed. I mean, it could be, I mean, boycotting. Boy, boycotting a business for one reason or another, or another is a form of a temporary, uh, or I guess potentially permanent, cancel culture. You know, if you don't like what a company is doing, um, or their, their products or whatever, for whatever reason, um, you can boycott that, and that is a form of cancel culture. Um, so I'm not. I think some cancel culture it can be good. You know, think about Bill Cosby, right? Um, is his cancel is is him being canceled justified? Yeah, yeah, it's justified. Sure, sure. Um, Adolf Hitler, him being canceled? Yeah, he should have been canceled much earlier than he kind of canceled himself, right? But. Uh, he should have been canceled. Yeah, definitely he should be canceled. His thoughts and ideology should be canceled. But what we should not do is um, merely dismiss a person and try to expel them from public discourse on the ground that they are intolerant. Even... Um, even uh, white supremacists, as terrible as a philosophy as that is, or or the Black Panthers on the other extreme, on you know the other side of the uh, the aisle, terribly bad bad ideology, white supremacists, Black Panthers, bad on both sides. Should they be expelled from public discourse? That is a good question. I, I, I don't know. I don't think we should expel them. Um, but we should engage, with, as Christians, we should engage them with love, just as we should any other group that we do not agree with, and try to show them Christ, and try to walk the line between, between showing them God but also being careful not to cast our pearls to swine. There is that, and it takes the Holy Spirit, it takes the wisdom of the Holy Spirit um, to guide us. I mean, that's highly, highly situational. That's a highly, it's a Holy Spirit kind of thing in there to know when you got to keep engaging or when you got to step back and just pray, pray for them because you realize that the efforts are just throwing, casting your pearls to swine at some point. Here we go. The price of citizenship in a liberal democracy is that citizens will not impose their convictions on others. They will not use the power of the state to coerce belief. Sure. Um, each person is free to practice his or her belief or unbelief. But as Ross Dutat, Dutat, not sure, 
rightly points out, that's the theory. In practice, the admirable principle that nobody should be persecuted for their beliefs often blurs into the more illiberal idea that nobody should ever publicly criticize another religion or champion one's own faith as an alternative or say anything whatsoever about religion outside the privacy of church, synagogue, or home. And of course, that's, that's, it's unfortunately religious views are being pushed to the private arena. We should be bold in the public square with wisdom. And a lot of people, you know, with the abortion thing going on now, um, a lot of so-called pro-choicers, um, they would say that, oh, well, is it not, is it not coercion of the state to, to make abortion illegal? That you are that the state is thereby controlling the female body um, to force them to have bring the child to birth. That's that's the wrong question <laughs> entirely, right? Because there's a child inside of their body. This is the argument that I don't see how pro choicers just don't get time and time again. That yes. It, it is the woman's body, yes. But the woman chose to engage in a, well, unless she was raped, right? But by and large, she chose to engage in a sexual act. That was her choice. What is the well-known <laughs> and natural result of sex? That is pregnancy, right? We all know that that is what sex is is um, is fundamentally biologically for. Yes, there's the enjoyment aspect of it, of course, and that is a good aspect of it. However, it is for procreation, and so anytime you engage in sex, that is you exercising your um, how do they term it um, reproductive rights. Right. Your reproductive rights are your ability to choose who you reproduce with, who you choose to have sex with. Right? That is your uh, reproductive right. Now, if you are raped, that is a violation of your reproductive right. And that the rapist should be punished to the full extent of the law. But... Once you have made that choice, if the logical conclusion of that exercise of reproductive right comes to comes to fruition in pregnancy, well, then at that point, it's not just your body. Your body is def most definitely in the mix. Do not get me wrong. You're absolutely right about that. But there's another body inside of you, and not they're not inside of you in your stomach. They're not in your gut over here. They're not in your thigh. They are in the one organ in the, in the human body that is specifically made for them to be nurtured and to grow. They are in your womb. And that, that womb is, is their safe space. They have a right to claim your womb as their own, as their own, as their fortress, inviolable fortress, because they are another person, and the womb is made was made for them. Whether you are a creationist, you know God made that for the baby. If you're an evolutionist, then this evolved for the baby, right? The womb is for a baby. That's what it's for. And they have a right to claim that as their castle. I mean... You know, we, we have the castle doctrine, right? We can defend our homes against invasions. We shall also apply that castle doctrine to the womb for a child. 
because that womb is for them. That womb is not for you. Your body's for you, but that womb within your body is for them. And they are a distinct human entity at that point. And to give a woman the right to for a doctor to take the to choose to give the woman the right to let a doctor take that life of a human being inside of the, their womb which was made for that baby that is coercion that is ultimate coercion that is state sanctioned um execution of an innocent I mean, I'm a parent. My child is has been outside the womb for eight years. If I all of a sudden say, oh, I don't want to have him anymore, and if I stop feeding him, if I stop taking him to school, if I stop doing what the state expects me to do as a parent, I will be in trouble with the Department of Child Services for neglect and abuse, and I could go to jail, right? Why is it any different for a baby who's not yet outside of the womb? They have a right as well. And so the, the, the greater coercion is to coerce that child to die, merely because they're not wanted than to coerce the woman to bring that child to birth whenever they engaged, most, most of the time, engaged in an act that they knew full well the logical conclusion of that act was for a child to be there. Here's another one. He's quoting, uh, Carson is quoting, Edward Langerak. He, Ed, Edward Langerak uh, wrote a book called Theism and Toleration, from where this these quotes come from. Tolerating another's actions is quite compatible with trying to change another's mind, as long as one relies on rational persuasion, or perhaps emotional appeals, rather than blunt threats or subtle brainwashing, right? The old tolerance was like, let's, let's hash it out. Let's go, let's go, um, you know, tooth and nails with words and with thoughts and with ideas in a civil manner. Yeah, we can have heated, we, we can have heated, impassioned debates, but let's do it with words. Let's do it with uh, votes. And that's the old tolerance. Let's have a battle of ideas, but let's not kill each other. Let's not maim or hurt each other or imprison each other or keep each other from um, making, you know, making a living in society in order to take care of themselves and their family from advancing through society. That is what the old tolerance is. But the new tolerance is something entirely different. It's not tolerance at all. It's intolerance. Within such large, this is Carson, within such large frameworks of moral reasoning, Tolerance is seen as a virtue because of its concern for the common good. Once tolerance is cut loose from this larger moral vision, however, and becomes shackled to notions of individual freedom to do what one pleases absent much consideration of the common good, it, bec it becomes quite a different sort of beast. Yeah. So if you're looking at it as um, tolerance helps preserve peace, in society, yeah, that makes sense. That's that's the old form of tolerance. Let's not kill each other because we simply 
disagree with each other. Let's uh, talk it out. And even if we don't disagree with each other, even if talking it out doesn't make us agree with each other, we've still have talked it out and we can still live our lives peacefully. That makes sense. That's a larger, the common good form of the old tolerance. But now, um, the new tolerance is shackled to the postmodern idea that every single person can basically be their own god. They make their own truth based upon lived experience. <laughs> oh, man. So, in that, in that my claims to truth, however wacky and wild they may be, um, they are as equally valid as anybody else's. And that everybody else should respect them as such. Okay, I'm going to take a little, um, I'm going to stop here. This is definitely going to be a two-parter. So I hope you have um, enjoyed part one of The Intolerance of Tolerance by D.A. Carson. Um, I've enjoyed presenting it so far, and I will uh, try to have the second part finished by next week so i will be back on here and hope you guys all have a great week god bless and thank you for watching bye